think tigers. The modern audience, I think, is very used to things that move. Maybe a one and a half minute video that you see on the internet is the most familiar thing you can think of. And a painting is a very old medium. For example, a painting doesn't move. Um, it's one of the only art forms that has no sense of time. The painting is the same today as it will be in a few hundred years. Music changes very quickly, even a sentence of writing does. A painting has no exploding bus. There's no celebrities. There's no, um, there's no fire. It's, uh, it stays still. And the modern audience isn't really familiar with looking at a painting. One of the things that's very important about a painting, and it's something that I feel is important for an artist, it's a medium. It's one choice of a way to communicate with people. And you'll find this with a lot of artists, is the artist has a responsibility at some point to draw attention to important issues. Um, the artist's job is very limited, though. An artist is like a journalist. The artist doesn't tell you what to think, but rather says, this is what I saw. If you think, for example, of, of Goya, the disasters of war, some of the pieces just said, I was here. And one thing that's happening right now when we're having a glass of wine and, and wondering what's going to happen with the Diamond Jubilee and you know, having a chat, um, tigers are going extinct. There are only 3,200 tigers left in the wild. There are only 10,000 tigers in captivity. And those tigers can't be put back to the wild. There are more tigers in Texas, in the United States today, than there are in all of the wild combined. And the question you would ask is, how come you never hear about this? How many people here heard that there's problems with the tigers? You heard about the beluga sturgeon, because that's going to affect your caviar. Or you heard about the bluefin tuna, because that's going to affect your sushi. But did you really hear about the tiger? Well, the tiger has two main enemies, very simple. One is that the tiger is losing habitat. And if you look at a map of the world, wherever people live, tigers do not. When there was the ivory crisis and African elephants' population started to decline, if you look at a map, you'll notice as elephants have smaller and smaller areas to live and people take up more areas. And of course, there's an overlap. At some point, every area has a border or a boundary where people and the animals need to interact. Um, the second main enemy of a tiger today is what's called traditional Chinese medicine. And the bodies of tigers are actually captured locally. The tigers are ground up and made into powders, and they're sold for very, very high prices. Um, there's no evidence that Chinese medicine actually cures any ailment. And the analogy that it does is kind of like saying that if you eat an acorn, then you'll grow as tall as a tree. Now, you're probably asking the question, why am I painting tigers? Um, and this actually started a long time ago when I studied the Slade here at UCL. I was very interested in, uh, I had just come back from an African uh, project doing heat balance for elephants. I just wanted to do something interesting after college. And at UCL, I decided to take some courses. So I took a diversity, diversity of vertebrates course. I, wrote about the origin of the elephant's trunk, and uh, went to the Regent's Park Zoo, and traveled a lot. And that was sort of the basis of some of my interest in animals with backbones. Uh, people are a lot like any animal that has a backbone. I thought if I'm going to understand, as a student, how to ever have a backbone myself, I should know something about things with backbones. Um, Jump forward a lot. In 2003, I woke up one morning. I was living in Florence, Italy. and. I had been working with a ballerina doing some small sketches, and I'd heard it's the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg, Russia. And I just woke up one morning and I said, I love Florence, but I'm going to move to Russia and paint ballerinas. And I went and met a man named Leonid Nadarov, who was in charge of the academy. And I came up to him and I said, oh, hi, I just came from Florence, and I want to paint ballerinas. And he was a KGB colonel at one point. And he was a very uh, serious man. And he looked at me and he said, well, show me your paintings. And I can, so I showed him my portfolios. And he says, but where are the ballerinas? 
And I said, well, actually, I've never painted a ballerina before. I don't really know anything about ballerinas, but this would be a good place to start. And he immediately stopped. He got on the phone and he said, get out of my office. And he got on the phone and he called somebody up and somebody came in and he said, take him to the library. This is terra incognito. He knows nothing about ballet. And that was true and it was the same when I started working with tigers. I went to uh, Kiev and I worked with the National Opera and Ballet there and I got my first introduction to the tigers. And I managed to be able to work many times backstage with the Ukrainian National Circus with the idea if I was ever going to say anything about a tiger, I better get near one. I better know something about tigers. And so during this period, I had a chance to get to know the tiger trainers, get to know what they eat and what they don't. Uh, in the end, the paintings that you see, they're all paint started from sketches. I took a lot of photographic reference because tigers do not stay still. Um, I got to go where they're feeding tigers and meeting the tigers and spend time with the tigers and the trainers. And that is the basis for the work that's here. If you have a chance to look at the paintings upstairs, some of them are in an installation called Nudo e Crudo, which Italians will know means raw and naked. And these paintings were all done from life, and a lot of them serve as the basis for the other paintings. The next step, getting away from the circus, I started to work with themes, more contemporary themes. For example, what does it mean if uh, a tiger is in your house? And th this painting over here, tiger in the house, um, basically it's probably not a good idea to have a tiger in your house. Um, and this painting here, for example, this one is called the striped dress. And you'll find that if you look, you'll see tigers everywhere. And they're, they're extraordinarily important, not just for their power or their grace or their history or the way they've influenced culture, but they matter today. And if you speak to anyone who's familiar with biology or ecosystems, you can't take the top predator out of any area without destroying the balance of everything. And the reason to protect the tiger is that the tiger is actually in place to keep everything in equilibrium. And I would guess everyone in this room has a, a, a tiger within them somewhere. Um, you may have a family member who drinks too much, someone who uses drugs, someone who gambles, somebody who is trying to uh, uh, come to terms with some interior force which is very powerful and very beautiful and very dangerous. So I, I think the main thing that I would like you to do, just to have stopped for a moment and actually take a moment, I appreciate very much you listening to me because I don't have an exploding bus or something else to get your attention really, that to think about tigers and some point talk to somebody you know or look up tigers or mention tigers and participate somehow in protecting tigers. Think Tigers.